Shalom and welcome to this week's Living Torah. Yes, I survived a week and uh, it just dawned on me that I actually did record a Living Torah video last week and uh, I put it on the website, forgot to put it on the newsletter, forgot to put it uh, on YouTube and wherever else I put things. So uh, it was it was quite a week. We had a, a wonderful time with our family. Thank you for those who emailed with uh, their prayers and blessings. It was... Um, it was, it was great. The only thing is I had to drive to Atlanta three times. Uh, one of them was last Tuesday morning. At, we left, I left the house at 5 a.m. The next morning was 4.30 a.m. to Atlanta, which is two and a half hours away. And so there's no, uh, there's, I do have a reason for forgetting to upload a few things to the right places. It was just, uh, if you've ever driven in through around wherever atlanta georgia you know it's not a great experience so uh, i'm back and uh, headed toward at the end of the month Mannheim, pennsylvania if you're going to be able to join us there again i do ask that you send us send me an email of some type uh some type of communication so i can let them know we will have some visitors uh along the way with that uh let's see uh the end of the month by the way uh, i will be in pennsylvania but honok young will be here at franklin in franklin north carolina at life assembly so information you can uh, again email for that and uh, i know that he is he's I, I think tonight with barry phillips this is a today's a tuesday yes he's be with barry phillips either tonight or tomorrow night one of the two and then on to various other places in colorado you can go to coleyehuda.com and get his schedule um israel tour one more thing israel tour is book solid for this year and we've got about a half a tour already booked for next year so if you're interested you might want to go ahead and uh, and and at least get on that waiting list for that one okay we're going to go to the Torah portion of Ray or C. Of course, I've talked numerous times about what this word means. It's not just about seeing with our physical eyes, but perceiving uh, our perceiving our destiny, perceiving our destination, perceiving what the Almighty is doing in our lives. And He says, "See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse." Well, it's pretty obvious, I, I think, to most of us where we'd like to live in the midst of that. But let's let's look at these words a little bit more. The word blessing is bracha. Uh, we we use that in, in many of our blessings. We use the word bracha. And it does mean blessing. It means prosperity, which is not necessarily, you know, winning the lottery. I, in fact, I... Most people that win the lottery don't walk in blessing, uh, but that's another subject. It is, prosperity is having, in my definition of prosperity, is having what you need in life to fulfill his calling in your life. And if that's on a daily basis, then that's still bless blessing. Uh, it is a, a gift that he gives us. It is a, it can be uh, referred to as a treaty of peace. So when Pinchas, Phineas, was given the, the covenant of Shalom, what was he given? He was given a special bracha. Uh, let's, let's put it like this. Let me put it, bring another aspect into this. That the blessing of Yah in our lives is his presence in our lives. You know, anyone that's ever lived for any amount of time with outside of, those, of his presence understands that the greatest blessing that the Father, the Creator, could ever give to any of us is for us to have a realization of His presence. The other side of this, of course, is the word curse. Um, how, how do we define that? It's the lack of all the above. Okay? It's the lack of all those things that, uh, that, that He gives us in the blessing. So it's a, a lack of prosperity. It is not just in a physical sense, but in, a, in, our, in our health and in our relationships and all of those things. It's, a, uh, it's a, the lack of his gifts, the lack of his, his presence in our lives. And it is, there, there is though a, 
aside of this word curse that is interesting, we're going to see that as we go into the next verses regarding Mount Gerizim and Mount Eval, is that the curse, if we look at the word, and it is a kuf, a lamed, a lamed, and a he in Hebrew, and if we, if we consider the, the, the pictograms, the, the paleo-Hebrew of this, the kof is the sun on the horizon. So we can see it as the, the rising sun. We have a double lamed, which the lamed is known as the letter of the king or the shepherd's staff. So a double portion of that. And then the hay, which is his breath. So if we consider that the reason he gives to us what would be considered the curse is so we could find him. He doesn't just leave us out there for, you know, well, we're not walking in his blessings, so we're just kind of wandering around all over the place aimlessly without any kind of direction in our lives. No, anyone that's ever walked, as, as I know all too well, anyone that's ever walked in a way that was contrary to his blessings, think about it. Can you look back over your life? And I was talking with someone this Shabbat, and they were, they were saying this exact thing, now that I think about it, that even though I was walking totally contrary to what his, his ways are, his blessing is, that I, I look back today, and I, could see, I see that he was always there. So it's a, a light that is bringing forth the, it is shining upon the king a double portion of his, the revelation of who he is so that we can then receive his breath, his authority, and his blessing in our lives. So if, you, if we see that we're, we're walking in something that's contrary, there, he's, he's even in that, which is a remarkable concept. So the... Uh, it all wraps around this one word, which, by the way, is, I believe, the, the biggest word in all of the English language. No, it's not the one that was in the, uh, in the movie years ago with Julie Andrews. That's a large word that many of us learned how to say, but that's not the biggest word in the English language. Uh, I was talking with someone yesterday. Uh, totally uh, a person that I don't know that they've ever really had much of a, uh, a thought of God in their lives. We were talking about just kind of various things, and uh, he spoke this, and it just, it just stunned me. I'd never thought about it. That uh, what is life? Well, if we look in the center in English of the word life, we have the word if. So life is about choice. It's about our choices. If we are to, if we do this, then we are going to walk in his blessings. If we do this, then we're going to walk in a way that's contrary to him, but he's going to be active in the process of bringing him back, bringing us to himself anyway. Now, if you can if you can describe to me, if you can explain that kind of grace and mercy, uh, go ahead, get your own YouTube channel. Because I can't explain that. I can state it. I can believe it. I can understand it. I can see it with my own life. But, but understanding that kind of love that he has for us, there's, there's no way. Not possible. He used this concept with the nation of Israel, with the Hebrews. As they were there, they were brought, we will, we read this after the book of Devarim, go into the book of Joshua, which I'm in the, the process of reading again right now. And he brings them to this section, this, this place in Israel that is between the mountains. They have Mount Gerizim on one side, Mount Eval on the other side, and in the middle is the, 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 the community, the town in that day that's called Shechem. Today, it is modern-day Nablus. 
uh, a place of, of terrorism, a place of the enemies of the Almighty, the enemies of Israel, a place that is spreading out. It is uh, the building there, the illegal building and occupation. Uh, it's, it's, out, it's, it's overwhelming going back time after time as I have through these years to see how much that place has grown. And it sits in one of the most prophetic places of all of Israel, a place that the Hebrews were brought to, a place that Abram himself, when we read in Genesis chapter 12, he came to the Oak of Moray, Elon Moray, where he could see those two mountains, not knowing that it would be the seed that he is still holding within his body. You know, at that time he's still Abram, he's not Abraham. Uh, it is a nation. It is the fulfillment of what the, the promises that, he had been, that had been spoken over him. There's no way that he could have understood that years later his offspring would stand between those two mountains and make a choice. And today, his offspring is still standing between those two mountains, making a choice. Today, the voices, the voices of Nablus are trying to, uh, are, are, are trying to drown out the voice of the Almighty. The voices of anti-Semitism, the voices of hatred, the voices of some just misunderstanding. But those voices are becoming greater and greater in our day. And we have a choice, whether to look to Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing, or to look to Mount Eval. To walk in obedience is to walk on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing. To walk in disobedience, the curse is to, mount, is to walk on Mount Eval. I've walked on both of those mountains physically. Uh, anyone that's followed the, the news through the last years of the finding of Joshua's altar. Where's Joshua's altar? It's on Mount Eval. I haven't taught on this in quite some time. And the question has to be asked, why is the altar on the Mount of Curses? Well, it's because if we're walking, in my mind, if we're walking in his blessing, then we're walking in the revelation of his 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 Messiah. We're walking in the revelation of his restoration. We're walking in the revelation of his life. But when we depart from that, then we must go to that altar, that altar of repentance, the altar that restores us and moves us from the Mount of Mount Eval back to the Mount of Blessing. It says, when you come into the land, that uh, in chapter 12, starting in verse 2, you must destroy all the places where the nations you are dis dispossessing serve their gods, whether on high mountains or hills or some other leafy tree. Break down their altars, smash their standing stones to pieces, burn up their sacred poles completely, and cut down the carved images of their gods, exterminate the name, their name from that place. Well, we can read the book of Joshua, and we can see that they didn't do this. Now, before we stand in judgment of them, let's consider a spiritual aspect for each of us. The word destroy is a, a very strong word, and if you look to Strong's to find out what the word means, it's not a trick, folks. It means to destroy. They were to go in and literally wipe out everything. They were to kill men, women, children. Destroy the altars. Destroy even the place that the, uh, the altars had been built. Destroy the standing stones. Everything. Burn the sacred poles completely. Cut down the carved images of their gods. They were to exterminate the name of the gods and the people that had defiled the land. They didn't do it. But before 
I start pointing my fingers at their failure. I have to ask myself, have I been that uh, strong with this word regarding things of my own life? Have you been that strong with things of your own life? You know, I, I think probably as, as we would consider this, if we had a, a time to just sit and talk about it, we would probably come to the conclusion that, well, maybe destroy is a kind of a harsh word. Uh, may, maybe I'll just, you know, put, put it in a box over here. So just in case I want to look back at the memories, I can. There's things you need to destroy. Uh, Kathy and I were uh, were sent some pictures the other day, and uh, as we were going through them, it was uh, there was someone that was I'm not going to go into the details of this, of course, but there was someone in one of those pictures that uh, I, I I wish today that I had never allowed that person to be a part in any way, shape, or form of our family. Well. The next thing I knew, Kathy was was standing there above the trash can and she was tearing the picture up, which was the right thing to do. The, the, the things of our past, the memories, when we go through pictures, uh, books that are on our shelves, I had a friend of mine say, this morning I am going through and I'm spiritually and physically cleaning my house. That's what we, we need to do that. And not just waiting for Passover, not just waiting for Yom Kippur. But cleaning our house should be something we are doing on an active daily basis. I'm not just talking about my physical house, but the spiritual, the, well, yeah, the physical, the dirt man, the, the person. We need to be actively cleaning out and to quote uh, a CD that I, I had the opportunity, and I, I really encourage people to, to get this message that I released last month. Uh, this is an interview I did with a couple that I performed a wedding last month. Uh, it, it's available on our website to those who donate to our ministry. If, if you don't have the money or just don't want to give, I, that's whatever, just send me an email. I'll be glad to, to send you the link to the MP3 file. But this is one couple's um, story about the father actively bringing them together and the decisions that they made. And I, I, I preface the interview with, with, I'm not saying that this is what everyone has to do. I just, this was their story. So if you, you know, a person wants to stand in judgment, it's their story. That's how they, dis that, that's how they chose to live it. And at one point, they said how they had decided in the beginning of this relationship that they would have no physical contact between them, between the betrothal and the wedding. And as we talked about this, I, I heard one of them uh, say in this message, as the days grew closer to our wedding, we came to the conclusion that we needed to be more strict in our boundaries. We didn't let, need to let those boundaries kind of, uh, well, you know, I mean, we're close to the, no, we needed to be, they said we needed to be more strict in the observance, the commitments that we had to one another. You know, that just, that just resounded in me when they said that, because if we read the, the book of Ephesians, we see that the, the marriage the, the wedding, the whole concept of, of the betrothal is to be a picture of Messiah and his bride being brought to him. And so should it not be that as we grow closer, we believe to the, his return, that we would also become more strict in our observances. We're to show no mercy. Show no mercy to the things that can make us stumble. Now, he goes on and says, I'm going to bring you to the place that I will put my name. So, is where is this? Is it in Gilgal, where it, which is where that's actually the first capital of Israel was Gilgal. It's where they came across. 
You read this in Joshua. So many things happen in Gilgal, uh, all the way over to probably the, the baptism the, uh, to John the Baptist, Yochanan the Immerser. Uh, that probably happened at the area of Gilgal. This is the, the place that the Hebrews came across. This is the place that's known as the area the, the area of Achor, spoken of in the book of, of Hosea. It, was it there? Was it Shiloh, or English pronunciation, Shiloh, where we can see, uh, if you go on to a, uh, onto a search, whatever engine you use, uh, you go on and you, you type in uh, God's name in, Sh in, in Shiloh, you'll see the image that says that is in the rocks. It is yud heh vav -Hey. So is, is that where he would place his name? Or is it Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, the Horabite, where the, it is believed that the Almighty took the dirt to form Adam? where the first and second temple would stand, where I believe uh, the, the third temple will be. W where is it? Or is the, answer, is the answer yes? That yes, his name, because when, when we consider, I was talking to Eddie Chumney about this uh, just a couple days ago, when we consider the difference between Greek and Hebrew, uh, Brad Scott would teach on this, a form versus function. In Greek, we're, we're looking at the form. So, you know, where, where do you live? Well, you give a name and, and uh, a town and a city and, and all of those things. But it's, is it about the, the, the place or is it about where you're living? Your, your spiritual being? Where are you living as far as your morals? As, as far as the things that you're doing in your life. Which, which one is true? Well, if we get over here to the side of the Greek point, then it's just about our physical being. But when our physical life takes, is, is not as important to our, is our function of our life. When the form is not as important as the function, I guess is a better way to say that. Then we begin to understand what life is about to begin with. And so is it that they were brought to Gilgal? Yes. Then as they progressed in their obedience, in the prophetic nature of who they were, they were then brought to Shiloh, where the tabernacle would stand for 369 years? Yes. And then as the progression is that they were taken then to Jerusalem. Yes. And so where he puts his name is, well, we could see that as they came through the different stops in the wilderness, that movement would not change when they entered the promised land. So just because you might have uh, come out of Egypt and you've walked through a time of wilderness, and you've progressed in your life, and you feel that you've, you're, you're coming closer to, and even though where we go, physical sense in the millennium, are we still going to be changing? Are we still going to be moving? Are we still going to be moving forward? Yes. Uh, a little side note, even in the millennium, it's going to be about us going forward to that eighth day, eternity, is spoken of in Isaiah chapter 66. So don't get caught up in, well, the name is in the rock, so that must be where it's at. Well, the name may be in the rock to point you to, to bring you to that place and then direct you to somewhere else. Now, in the wilderness, it says in uh, verse 8, you will not do things the way you do them today. Where everyone does whatever is in his own opinion seems right. <laughs> uh, King James says something about uh, whatever seems right in your own eyes. The, the wording in Hebrew is, uh, is the word sh uh, yeshar, which is straight. 
So it's, it's the connotation of whatever seems straight to you. Are, are, are you trying to tell me that, uh, that, that in the wilderness that they weren't really listening to Moses? Have you read the story? Have you read the account? Have you, have you gone, did you read the book of Numbers? Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of people that were doing what was seeming right in their own eyes. They were walking in their own opinions. Uh, you know, who came up with the idea of, of let's not circumcise anybody in the wilderness? Let, let's, let's, who, who came up with the idea of, well, we don't need to do those festivals until we get to the, to the edge of the Jordan. Where, where did all that come from? I don't know. We're not, we're not really told. But it seems that in exile, in the wilderness, as they were being directed with the cloud of fire, the pillar of fire, the cloud, and the mishkan, the tabernacle in their midst, as they're being led to the promised land. Are you seeing a little similarity here? That people were doing what seemed straight to them. Hmm. With the tablets in the ark, in the center of the camp, they were still doing what was seemed right to them. I, I guess this... Uh, This, to me, brings forth a couple, uh, at least one question. Are we in this day, I say we in a a, a collective sense, uh, but if if, when when I say we in this day, I'm I'm trying to be nice, (laughs) but um, we do need to put all of us into this. But when a statement is made of we, we should actually turn the statement to am I, all right? So if I was to say it properly, I would say, are you or am I, not just are we? So you can put whatever you want to there. Uh, One of them is much more personal. One of them just kind of waters it down of, well, let's look at all of us around here and see where I'm at in this. And as long as God's grading on a curve, maybe I'm going to be okay. I don't see where he grades on a curve anywhere. So here, here let me just say, how, how, how open are you? Yeah, I'll just go ahead and dial it on in here. How open are you to counsel? And where are you receiving your counsel? Well, I just got this all figured out. You go to Facebook, you can find a bunch of people that uh, they are doing what is right in their own eyes. And if you want to get their dander up, just ask them a question. I mean, you don't have to challenge, just ask a question. It's like, rare. How dare you even come? How dare you even consider that what I am doing could be in any way not totally and completely righteous and true? Yeah, right. So, how open are we as a people? Am I as a person, as you as a person, to counsel? You know the the the, the verse in Proverbs. Uh, through the multitude of counselors, their safety didn't end with, re- with the coming of Messiah. It's still there. When they had issues in the book of Acts, what did they do? Yes, Yaakov, James, is the leader of the congregation in Jerusalem. Got that? Because if you want a, you know, if you want a problem... Go ahead and, 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 and join something that's led by a committee. It's normally not going to look too well in the end, but uh, that's another, another teaching. So, ja- Yaakov was the leader, but even the leader asked counsel. The leader had brought in counselors. 
A leader that will not listen to counsel is dangerous. And on the edge of, yeah, let me go ahead and say it, a cultic, a, a cult, yeah, not a cultic, but a cult practice. A leader that will not listen to counsel is in line to be a leader of a cult. Leaders need to actively seek out counsel. We had a discussion of some things not too long ago at Life Assembly, some direction that we're, we're uh, trying to work out. I began a process of going to, first of all, the men that I look to for counsel, I ask their opinions. There seemed to be a concise, a, a consensus between all of us. So this past Shabbat, I laid this out before the congregation. We, it, we, in the end, thankfully, we all came to the same consensus on it. But see, I could have just stood up this past Shabbat and said, this is what we're going to do. And the, the result would have been the same, yeah. But the, the spiritual dynamics of how the result came to would have been different. We all need to be asking, seeking counsel in this day. Let me quote someone. I won't give the the. the the quote, uh, the person here right now, but something that stuck with me years ago. The question, if you, if you look, if, if you ask a question outside of scripture, the answer is normally money. I would expound on that a little bit and say the answer is normally money and power. Okay, We look to what's going on in the world. Why are people doing what they're doing? Money and power. Money and power. Money and power. It, I mean, it just, you, you can take everything else, every, every other answer, and you can put it into one of those two or both most of the time. I know every rule has an exception. If we look in the scripture, the question is Messiah. Where is Messiah in this? And the answer should be a revelation of Messiah. Let me read to you something that I started with last Shabbat at Life Assembly. Uh, this is worth, I believe this is worth writing down. This is maybe one of the most important concepts that, uh, that I've ever taught on. When we open the scripture, whether it be the, the Torah the prophets, the writings, the gospels, the apostolic writings, the revelation. When we open the scripture, are we reading words or seeing a person? Uh, Moses in, uh, I believe it's, uh, I didn't, I don't have the reference written down here, but when asked, about who he was, Yeshua said, if you believed Moses, you would believe me because Moses wrote about me. Often quoted verse of mine, proverb, or excuse me, Psalm 40 verses six or seven, depending on your translation. Behold, I am coming in the scroll of the book it is written of me. Uh, this is a statement. I think every one of us should write down. When I open the word, am I reading words or am I seeing a person? When we seek counsel, are we seeking Messiah? Or are we seeking rules and regulations? Are, are we seeking a way to please him? Or are we seeking the person who allows us to enter into pleasing him? Things to think about. In uh, 
verse 23. Just take care not to eat the blood, for the blood is the life, and you're not to eat the life with the meat. Now, I know that this has been taken into a lot of different places. Uh, I'm not going to speak for or against those. Uh, I know people that choose to only eat meat that is rabbinically kosher. Um, I, I support that decision. It's not a decision that I, that I practice. Okay? It's not my conviction. Uh, there are people that will not eat a steak that is rare. Well, that doesn't really affect me because I don't like my steak rare, okay? I like it cooked. I, I don't, when I cut into a piece of meat, I don't want it mooing or clucking or making any kind of other sound at me. I like to make sure that that thing, when it's on my plate, it's dead. And so that, those are things that don't really affect me in, in this. But the, the, the concept is further than that. In that day, what they had come out of in Egypt and would enter into Canaan and see was pagan practices. And this goes over to the book of Acts, Acts uh, chapter 15, I believe it is, and the questions that were being asked about the Gentiles coming into faith. What do you do with them? What do you do with the pagan practices? Because in paganism of that day and... Let me be very clear, paganism of our day is the practice of eating blood. Anyone that's ever seen the movie uh, from a long time ago, Red Dawn, when the guy kills the deer, what does he do? He drinks the blood. This is not showing respect for life. What is, what is the concept here? What is trying to be taught here? Having respect for life over everything. Not drinking of, not consuming the life of something else. Um, this, is, this is a, stum I don't have time to go into this all uh, totally, but this is why the, the, the words of Yeshua were such a stumbling block. Of, Eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Because to those that were thinking in a physical sense, they were seeing his words as blasphemy. And rightfully so. He was not speaking to them and saying, you know, when, when, I'm, when you see me hanging upon an execution stake, uh, join in with cannibalism. As you see my blood that is, is draining from my body, get, you know, go get a, a cup. That, that's not what he was saying in any sense. He was saying, you need to enter into my life. And so this, this, the, the, this verse is about we need to be very conscious of what life we're entering into. It is very easy in this day to enter into a life which produces death. We, we can do that through just feeding ourselves with, with negativity. Feeding ourselves with, uh, with, with, with entertainment that's ungodly. Feeding ourselves with... Uh, with, with language, with, with all kinds of different things we could put into this. Don't partake of the life that brings forth death. In chapter 13, it talks about a prophet. A prophet that comes and uh, arises among you and, and gives you a sign and a wonder, and, but in the end is taking you away from the Torah says you are to put that one to death. Consider, uh, there are many teachers out there today that I personally don't care to listen to. Uh, they, they may have some good things to say along the way. They, there might be some signs and wonders. I don't know if they're true or not. Okay? But the test of a 
righteous prophet is not signs and wonders. Yeshua spoke this and said, signs and wonders, look at the book of, uh, look at Mark 16, signs and wonders will follow those that believe. Yes, there will be signs and wonders, got it. But we're not to follow them. We're to follow as the book of Joshua says. We are to follow the Torah. We're not to deviate to the left or to the right. Because I personally believe that if we continue to follow the Torah, the first five books, the instructions that are given in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, in which all other scripture is based upon, that if we continue to do so, and then instead of just looking at the words, we are seeing the person in the words, then we will be a people that are walking in spirit and truth, and the outcome of that will be that signs and wonders will follow us. Don't get the cart before the horse. In fact, we're told that if your prophet is one that has signs and wonders, but is not leading you to Torah, that you're to uh, put them to death. I truly believe that there's many people today that have subscriptions to teachers that they should put the subscription to death. Is, is it worth wading through? Is it worth, well, I, you know, after I listened to them, you know, they, they made a little sense. I, I got to think through it. And all of a sudden you got confusion. Because was it the signs and wonders or was it the word? And it's confusion. Confusion must be put to death. And so be very cautious in who you're listening to. Are they charismatic or are they anointed? Discerning the difference between a charismatic teacher and an anointed teacher. A charismatic teacher will get you to look over in this hand for the signs, the wonders, the bunny in the hat while over in this hand, leading you totally astray from the words that will give you life. And it, it, it may be difficult to, to grab a hold of this, but in verse 7, uh, verse 6, 7, depending on your translation, if your brother, the son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, or your wife, whom you love, or your friend who means as much to you as yourself, secretly and tries to entice you to go and serve other gods which you haven't known, go on and read the rest of that. It says, put them to death. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that we should, you know, go out and kill them, all right? That's kind of against the law today. Put them to death as far as their voice in your own life. You, you, uh, you go have, you know, go to dinner at your relative's house. You put in which relative it is. And though you've told them 112 times, maybe even 113, I don't eat that. I don't eat pork. I don't, I don't eat shellfish. And once again, oh, I forgot. Really? No, you didn't forget. You're being rude. You're being disrespectful. And the next thing out of their mouth, well, it, it, it's just a little bit. I mean, I, you know, it's just a little bit of bacon in the collard greens or the, the, or in the, the, the green beans. And I just picked the meat out. That means that the next invitation that you have to their house for dinner, you don't go. You say to them, I've told you over and over again that this is what I don't eat. Because my conviction, I'm not telling you you have to, but my conviction is that I don't eat that. But over these times, you, you, you have not respected me. 
I mean, if, if you called and said, the doctor said that if I eat this, that I'm going to have a heart attack and die, what would they have done? Oh, I, no, there's, we, we, we rid the house of everything. No, but because God said it. Because God said it, it's a problem. So the next time they call and ask you to dinner, you say, no, you've disrespected me for the last time. And until you show respect for me, our relationship is, is not what it was. And you leave it with them. You have, in a way, put them, that relationship to death until they make the move for it to be resurrected through their own repentance, which gives you an opportunity for forgiveness and brings forth the power of God in that relationship. I know that's just, that's just craziness. It's too, too simple, right? Chapter 14, lastly. Um, you are to be a, uh, because you are a people set apart as Kadosh for Adonai, your Elohim, Adonai, your Elohim will ch has chosen you to be his own unique treasure. Out of all the peoples on the earth, on the face of the earth, the word unique treasure is uh, translated by King Jimmy as a peculiar people. Please don't take that to an extreme, uh, as, as some have. But the word in Hebrew is, uh, is many, many things it's translated into English. But uh, one of my favorites is, it's a, is you're a jewel. You're to be a jewel. You're to be his jewel. But how do we see ourselves? Oh, I got too much to do in three minutes. How do we see ourselves? Do, do we see ourselves as, as, a, as a piece of coal? Worthless? Kind of ugly? Do we see ourselves as, as fallen man? Or do we see ourselves as do we see ourselves as as a failure? Or do we see ourselves as a process? A process that is making it to a goal. See, a, a coal is is just a well. I, I won't go get into the science of all this, but let me rephrase it. Then a diamond is. Basically, a piece of coal that made it good, made good under pressure. I was talking to a, a guy the other day, a teenage, uh, a young person, and um, it's kind of a fun relationship developing here. And they were saying how you know they're going in, going to college and going to be studying for for nursing. And I said they were talking about how I, I just don't know if I can do it. It's hard. It's going to be hard. And going and I, I just looked at this person. I don't know where they're at spiritually. I haven't gotten really to that place in in life. But uh, I said, you know, life is hard, and and anything worth doing is going to be hard. And I, I, I came. I saw him about two or three hours later. And I, as I when I did, I, he says, you know, I've I've been thinking about that ever since I saw you that you said to me, life is hard, and anything worth doing is going to be hard. He said, I, I've never thought of it. The guy's almost 20 years old. He never thought of that? No, because most people are not taught these things. We need to realize, life is hard. It's designed to be. It's a process. And the process is turning what's called man, fallen man, a piece of coal into diamonds that are a special treasure unto him. Embrace the pressure. The end result is beautiful. Shabbat Shalom. Shavua Tov. Have a blessed, prosperous week. Bezrat Hashem. God willing. See you again next week. Until then, eh, be strong under pressure. Yivarech Adonai V'yishmarecha Ya'er Adonai panav elecha V'yichunecha Yisa Adonai Yeah.
Shasem Lecha Shalom